Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having an excellent one Wednesday at DrupalCon Vienna. We're going to talk a little bit about automating your automation today. I'm Greg Anderson. You may have seen my name in the queue of Drush, Robo, Consolidation, CGR, and other build type tools. I'm a platform engineer at Pantheon and also an open source contribution engineer. Uh, Pantheon sponsors a lot of my time to do this work. So today we're going to talk about automation and automating your automation and taking it to another level. I'm going to start the question with, you, well, what, what are you going to automate? What can you automate? To do a good automation, you want to identify something that you do repetitively. You want to start off by making it good so you don't take a bad practice and do it a lot of times. Survey the available tools, automate it, and then start over, because you can always improve the process. So we want to build all the things, because we don't want tedium in our life. We're, in this um, presentation, we're going to mostly talk about development tasks, testing, deployment, and maintenance, which I mean software updates. And it's really exciting, because you know we have a lot of repetitive tasks in our lives, and we set out to automate all the things, but it's always a good idea to consider, you know, what's the cost? And any time I talk about automation, I like to show this XKCD cartoon. You don't even have to read the whole thing. It just breaks it down on a matrix. Like, how many times do you do this task? And how long does it take you to do the task? And then he gives you a time budget. He says, you know, if you, if you do it this often, you spend this long, you're not allowed to just spend any more time than this on automating. And it's, it's, it's very practical and uh, straightforward, but it's also really funny because, you know, the typical um, parable is the man in the forest and he has his axe and he's trying to chop down the tree and it's really hard to chop down the tree, but he can't because his axe isn't sharp enough. It's taking him a really long time and, you know, people are saying, well, well why don't you stop and sharpen your saw? I said, I can't because I have so many trees to chop down. And this joke is kind of the opposite. It's the engineer who's sitting there and he's like, Okay, I can't start chopping down that tree yet. My, my saw is not sharp enough. I'm going to make it sharper. I'm going to make it sharper. And if you just spend all of your time on dev tools, then your real product doesn't get any attention. So you need a happy balance in there. But the happy balance isn't just the sum even gain that's shown in this chart, because the time payoff that you put into automation is going to pay off more than one to one. Because not all time is created equal. If you get into a crunch situation and you have a bug in the field and you need to redeploy, if you've put a lot of time into your automation or if someone else has put a lot of time into your automation system for you, so you have confidence that you can test and roll out in an automated fashion, then you can respond to those emergencies a lot faster. And having a fast response time is worth an investment. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, if you're not planning on working on your project all by yourself from now until the end of time, you may occasionally have new people join your project. And when there's automation in place, it's easier to bring people on. In fact, one of the key signs of a project that's reaching unmaintainability um, is if you can't bring on new people. That's when it's really time to refactor the code, make it better, and work on some automation. Uh, furthermore, as you make small improvements, your process will improve over time. Because you can keep building. You automate one thing, you make it a little bit better, and uh, next time you can just improve on that. The strategy I like to take is if I have some big task and I'm doing it over and over again, I don't go to the XKCD chart and stop everything I'm doing for five days until I have good out automation. Usually I do a little automation and I use my new automation to finish the task and the task is better and I do spend some time debugging my automation. It takes me longer to do it than if I had just done it all manually, but the next time it's a little better, it's more reliable, and soon I reach the point where that task is fully automated because I spend less and less time doing just the repetitive type parts and get more and more value out of the rep uh, repetition. And so the result of this, if you have really got an automation system, is that it becomes possible to do more. So in that XKCD chart, the task that you used to do once a week, if it's automated, you might just do it every day because it doesn't cost you anything anymore. 
It can just happen in the background. And that'll give you a much more robust and reliable system. Sometimes when we're faced with the long road of automation, it just becomes discouraging. Like the all the things meme. We really have to automate all the things. I've got a lot of things to automate. But if you just fall into discouragement and don't set down out on the road of automation, then you're going to incur some costs that are not directly measurable. Your manual process is more prone to error and mistakes. There's a risk of loss of knowledge. Either you might forget or if people leave the organization, manual processes are very vulnerable to that. And just as increased automation gets better and better over time, the more you put off lack of automation, the more your system as it grows is going to become more complex and more bespoke and more and more error to prone and to mistakes. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools of the trade, things you can use to help you get your automation in gear. We have service APIs available to us from a number of the web applications that we all like to use and love, like GitHub, CircleCI, Travis. These have APIs that let you do things like creating pull requests, post comments on the pull request, configure your credentials so that your tests will start up, and uh, various webhooks. Automating creating pull requests on GitHub can be a really valuable addition to your automation tools because GitHub is already set up to be automated with a testing system like Circle. So if you have a process where you need to do something, a really good way to spin that off is to have a little script that does the automation and as part of the automation at the end step, creates a pull request for it because then your automation is gonna spin up and it's gonna test the automation script that you just wrote. So there's a couple easy ways to create a pull request on GitHub. There is a hub tool, and uh, GitHub also offers a REST API, which of course is what the hub tool uses under the hood. <coughs> Excuse me. So before you actually create the pull request on GitHub, you have to get the code there. And from the command line, this is something you do all the time. It's just to get push. And if you add in the dash u origin, the next time you push, it'll remember where that branch was going to. Um, and, and this is something we all do all the time. But if you're scripting it, you have the added challenge of authentication. If you're an end user and you're pushing to GitHub, usually you have a user account and you're authenticating with an SSH key. But GitHub has a really nice feature that allows you to push with um, an OAuth token. And I'll show you in just a second how to generate those, but uh, the push command doesn't have to push to an origin that you've already set. If you just provide a full URL to a repository as the target of the push command, then your branch will be pushed up to that origin, and you don't have to waste time in the script creating a remote just to delete it or keep it around. Um, and that URL that has the uh, repository in it can also be pushed to the X OAuth basic uh, form where you just put your GitHub token right on the line that does the push. So this is great for scripts because it keeps everything um, up and nice. I'm noticing some people in the audience are taking notes, which reminds me that I forgot to tell you something really important. And that is on, oh my God, I forgot to do it. I was going to tweet out its URL to my slides so you could follow along. But I promise at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna tweet out a URL to my slides so you don't have to write down all of these little nitty gritty details about how to do uh, a GitHub uh, OAuth token push. Because I'm gonna try to give you a bunch of these and uh, you don't wanna have to memorize all of it. So installing and using the hub tool is really easy. If you 
go to the Hub project on GitHub. It has a big README that has really good instructions, uh, and they have uh, they they support the various installers for Mac OS, Windows, and Debian. So just one line, and you can get the system installed. And uh, to create a pull request, there's just one simple command: hub pull request. You give it a comment, and boom, you have a pull request. It's going to get the um, target of the pull request from the branch information on uh, whatever repository is at the current working directory. It's really easy. If for some reason you're writing a tool and you don't want to have it depend on an external uh, tool like GitHub, you can also go to the REST API. And um, I've splatted a little bit of code here that shows uh, that it's just a very simple post. If you use the Guzzle library, those are easy to send. You just need to send it to the right URL. Um, the headers specify things like what data type you want to get your data back in. Application JSON is usually the most convenient for scripts. Um, GitHub likes it if you identify yourself um, in the user agent and your OAuth token just goes in the authorization headers. Um, and from there you post it away and uh, before you know it, you will have a pull request on your repository. So this is some additional details about the specific parameters that you use when creating a, a pull request. Now down in the head parameter, the third one where it's highlighted, it says forked repo. Um, you can leave that part off, including the, the colon, if you just want to create a um, pull request off of a branch that is um, in the same repository. But if you forked a repository, then use this colon form to specify where the pull request is coming from. Now once you have your lovely pull request, you may have occasion to want to post comments to it. The Hub tool, unfortunately, doesn't have a command that allows you to post comments to a pull request. But um, you can always use the REST API, and if you are excited about the concept of a Hub command, that posts a comment. Um, on the, the slides here, there's a URL of a pull request in the Hub tool that has the beginnings of a post comment uh, command. So, you know, when you're reviewing someone's pull request, you might have interesting comments about their engineering decisions on the project, and if you're writing a tool that's posting pull requests, uh, posting comments to pull requests, you might want to give status of the build information or links to assets that you create and things of that nature. So it's very easy to do this using the same GitHub API method that I showed a couple of slides ago. Uh, there's just a different URI that adds a comment and you attach comments to the SHA hash of the commit that you want to attach it to. And then you just have a uh, a body that has the text of the comment that you'd like, and it'll show right up on the page. So starting up tests is uh, something that we do a lot. Every time you create a new project, you need to get your tests written, and um, once they're running locally, you're going to want to make a circle YAML or a Travis YAML, and uh, after that you have to go and click on the buttons and find your repository. But we can automate that because CircleCI and TravisCI both have facilities for doing this. And uh, Circle doesn't have a tool to configure credentials. It does have a number of tools, but none of them have this particular command. Uh, TravisCI has a very, very complete tool that has lots and lots of commands in it, including one to configure test credentials. So the Circle REST API is very similar to the APIs that we just saw for GitHub. Um, here I'm showing you how to do it with the curl command line tool. And we just use the dash X flag to say that we want to post. Um, in this particular instance, this tool wants content type to tell you, to tell it what kind of um, 
result, you, it want, you want to send it back. And the particular key value pair for the credentials that you're setting go in the body. Now, in both Circle and Travis, there's a page where you can set environment variables. And that's what these credentials are. They're environment variables that will show up in your tests. So if you have a test that needs to do something like post a comment to GitHub on success, then you're going to want to configure one of these environment variables where you set GitHub token to the token value. And then it'll be available in your tests. Um, if you've never used this feature, it's also interesting to know that for the purpose of security, these environment variables are only set in your tests for pull requests that are originating from the master repository. If someone forks your repository and writes some code to dump the environment variables to the log, then the environment variables won't be set so that your credentials aren't exposed. The side effect of this is that your tests might not run correctly on community pull requests if they absolutely require credentials. And another thing to note, if you're just getting started with this API, if you look at the circle URLs in their web user interface, they shorten GitHub to GH everywhere. But in the REST API, it's spelled out GitHub. So if you mix those up, you'll get 404s that are a little confusing. Travis has a CLI tool, which I mentioned before is very functional, if you use Travis at all. Um, and it's one of the ones that I really recommend for PHP libraries. Um, you should install this tool and take a look at all of the other things that it does besides what I'm showing you today. Um, the command to set an environment variable is simply Travis N. So in one line there, you can see it's the equivalent of that curl post that I showed you on the last slide. And this will inject the environment variable GitHub token on our local machine into the GitHub token environment variable on Travis. Uh, there is also a web API for Travis, but it's really pretty complicated because they never fully implemented OAuth. So there's a lot of steps you have to do to authenticate. You have to start with your GitHub credentials, and then you ask Travis for credentials. And if you really feel the need to do that, um, the docs are here, and you can step through all of that work. But I've always just used the tool uh, because I just felt like the web API was a little too much work for my use cases. Looking on my XKCD graph, graph of how much time I can spend on this stuff. Maybe they'll provide OAuth like the other guy someday. So spinning up pro new projects is another thing that uh, sometimes happens a lot. It depends on what kind of work you're in. Sometimes you're working on just one project forever. Other times you might be an agency and you're spinning up projects all the time. Uh, Composer provides a command called create project. And if you've done any work with Composer managing Drupal sites before, you're probably familiar with this command because the canonical project, Drupal Composer, Drupal project, recommends using create project uh, for this purpose. Um, and once you create a new project, there are also post create scripts that, that um, Circle will run for you. So Composer create project will copy a template project that you specify, and it'll rename the Composer JSON components for you so that you have a, a brand new project. Um, and as I mentioned, this is being used by a lot of people to great success in the Drupal Composer Drupal project, project. but you can also leverage this to your own benefit. If you have a certain uh, set of things that you always do to a project all the time, um, you know, you could consider writing some sort of generator script for it to always add to these things in, which is a little time consuming. But the really easy thing you can do is if you just have manually made your own template once, you can just make an empty template in GitHub and register it with Packagist. And from there, it's very easy to use Composer Create Project and everything from the old project will come into your new project. You can set up your tests and have some sample test suites so everything's all scaffolded out for you. You don't have to spend a lot of time with uh, generators. The general model with Composer Create Project is the idea is that the new project is orphaned from the template. So if the template gets any changes done to it, all of the downstreams usually 
continue using whatever features they got at the time of creation. Uh, but it is possible to pull in updates, and all you need to do for that is go back to the GitHub project page for your template project, and the little button that says clone has a URL in it. You copy that, and then you can say git remote add another array origin. I named it upstream here, and paste in the URL you got from GitHub, and thereafter, if you say git pull upstream master, anything that happened in the parent will come and pull down into your project, and you may or may not have conflicts, just as any other um, git pull or, or merge. Uh, generally, though, uh, they encourage the, the more convenient way to do this is if you have something in the template project that you have a habit of changing a lot, it's better to move it into another project that you again register with Composer on Packagist and include in the template project as one of your requirements. So then you can just take your derived projects and run Composer update on them and all of the components that have might have modifications will come from these factored out pieces. When you use this model of development with template projects, it's helpful to make a, a number of small but not too small projects to hold these various things in. Now, Composer is also really neat. I mean, not only is it a mechanism for you pulling down a lot of code that you can manually run later, but Composer itself will also run code after you do installs, updates, and other commands. And a Drupal Composer Drupal project is one example of a template project that uses this technique. It uses a project called Drupal Scaffold. So Drupal 8, um, if you download it, a tarball from drupal.org, you get all of Drupal in, in one big directory, but if you're using the composer managed version, only the core directory appears in an actual project, and that project is called Drupal slash core. The other files that aren't inside the core directory, which is just a really minimal number of things, like index.php and your HT access example and things like that, those are not part of the composer managed project. So what Drupal Scaffold does is it goes out and it downloads those files individually from drupal.org and drops them into your project root. This composer doesn't like to put files into the project root. It's just a design decision for um, how composer works. And the way Drupal Scaffold works is it hooks into one of these post command hooks. So if you have any sort of similar processes where after you've created a project by a composer create project, if you have additional customizations that you would like to make, variables that you'd like renamed that comp composer create project itself doesn't touch, uh, you can easily hook in with one of these scripts to increase your automation. So I want to take a step back from automating your automation and talk just a little bit about automation and uh, basic test practices. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, if you want your automation to be really strong, you're going to want to start off with uh, good practices. So the best thing you can do to make your project testable is clearly enough to write testable code. And sometimes people are confused about how to write testable code because there are all these servers and untestable things and side effects. Um, but it all comes down to a really simple paradigm that if you want your code to be tested, you should just pass values into functions and your function should return values. And if you do that, then you can very easily write a unit test that uh, checks for this. It's the best way to test. So when you're designing your code, you should make as much of your code as possible follow this model. Now, for example, supposing you want to test something that's not testable. A canonical example of this might be the PHP exit function. Because if you run exit, then it exits everything, including PHP units, so you can't verify whether exit worked correctly. So the right way to test that is to factor that function into two functions. And one of them does all of the logic it needs to do, 
and then it just returns the exit code as a value. And the other function calls your testable function and then calls the exit status code. So by splitting apart your non-testable functions from your testable functions, you'll get as much of your code as possible in this clean and pristine state. And uh, while you're at it, I also recommend reducing the complexity of each function. If you have too many levels of nesting, split that function up and keep splitting it up until you only have like a cyclometric complexity of just one or two, which means you're really eliminating the number of ifs you have. Uh, and if you really want to become really um, optimized about this uh, refactoring, I'd recommend you Google an article called uh, Else is Evil. And uh, I don't literally believe that else is evil, but the author of this blog <laughs> made that case and argued that you shouldn't use else, and I would recommend you go and uh, take a little read of it, of it because it's eye-opening, and I've actually found that following his advice, and I, I've rephrased it to say don't use else in any place where you can avoid it. Um, so that keeps your code nice and clean. But not 100% of your code is necessarily going to be testable. So what do you do with the parts that aren't? And the best thing to do for the non-unit testable code is to write functional tests. And a functional test tests the entire environment. If we're building Drupal sites, this is actually easy to do because there's a tool called Behat. You just need to spin up a website and then Behat will allow you to pass requests to the web server, and it's written in a form that's very uh, user-readable user or allegedly user-friendly. Um, and the advantage of functional tests is that it's usually really easy to write tests, but the disadvantage is that sometimes it's hard, hard to maintain, because you might write a test that characterizes the behavior of your website, and depending on how fragile that uh, description is normal design changes will cause those tests to break and then you'll have to update them. Uh, so you want to be careful when you're writing your tests to really think about what the desired behavior is and not try to describe visual aspects of the screen very much, but actually test for operations. And then the other problem with functional testing is that it takes longer to run. So the alternative the functional testing is mocks. And a mock is a system or a technique for replacing an actual system with a piece of code that behaves like the system. So you, you remove the system that you are having trouble testing and replace it with um, something that just says, if, if I get this parameter in, then I would expect that the real system should pass this value out. And this can be really useful um, I recommend using mocks if you want to insert values into a function that you're testing, or you could also use mocks to pull values out of uh, functions. But the problem with mocks is they also can be sometimes hard to maintain because a false pass can creep in. If you've completely abstracted away some subsystem and that subsystem changes and you pull in that change with an update, if you've mocked the system, your mocks are going to keep passing. And that's bad because, you know, when we're automating updates, we want to be confident in our tests. And so I, I really find that um, mocks are a danger to reliability. And sometimes you have to use them. Um, but it's best to avoid testing the implementation. I sometimes see code that goes in and says, I'm going to call this routine, and then I assert that somewhere deep in this function, some other function is going to be called. And the problem with that, if you're testing the implementation, is that someone might rewrite that function in a way that's still compatible, but the test will fail, um, because something inconsequential changed. In the worst case, I've seen some people writing tests where they have a function and it just calls A, B, C, D, E, and then the unit test over there, it mocks A and it mocks B and it mocks C and it mocks D. And in the end, 
<laughs> it hasn't tested anything. It's just declared that the function was implemented in the way that the function was implemented. And um, that's, that's not helpful. So, you know, avoid looking at your test coverage code score as a badge of honor, because sometimes if you try to push that to too high, you'll end up cheating and actually hurt yourself. So uh, Docker is a really cool tool. A lot of people are using it, and I wanted to throw in some words about Docker because I've recently started using the new Circle 2.0, which leverages Docker quite extensively. Um, and one thing I've discovered with uh, Docker and, and Circle 2 is that it's really easy to make your own Docker image, and it's a good way to manage your test scripts especially if you have the system I was just describing. If you remember in the Composer Create Project example, if you have an example template project and it includes tests, some of the tests that it might include might include a circle YAML that does a certain number of steps. And I actually have a number of projects that are like this. And the tests may evolve over time. So you have this problem of, you know, how do you distribute changes to the scripts downstream. And the technique I was showing before about adding another remote and just doing a git pull will have a tendency to create a lot of conflicts and a lot of confusion because usually when you clone the project, one thing that you customize very, very highly are your unit tests and your unit test scripts. So what I do instead um, is, and you're probably familiar with this technique, in your Circle YAML, you can have bash, multi-line bash lines and can get as long as you want, but if it gets more than about one line, it's a good idea to put that script somewhere else and in a, a bash script that contains the aggregate of the functions you want to run, and then from your script, call that bash script instead. So what I've started doing is taking these little scripts and storing them inside of the Docker container. So now when I pull down my testing Docker container, it has the scripts I need that set up my environment for that Docker container. And if I change something about the Docker container, um, then I can change the script so that it is still providing the same set of environments that um, these projects are expecting. And that becomes a form of a contract, just like the functions you pass into a, a just like the parameters that you pass into a function and the values that are re returned from that function are a contract that you can describe with Simver. Similarly, these scripts that set up environment variables that contain a certain collection of credentials and things that you need for your tests can also form a contract. And so we can Simver version our Docker containers. So when I pull in a Docker container, I don't pull in latest, I pull in the Docker container 1.x. And then if I ever need to make a breaking change in the way my test scripts work, I start maintaining a 2.x of that Docker image, and then all of my old projects can continue to pull the old script until they're, they're updated. So how do you put this all together? Um, at the beginning of your circle configuration file, uh, there's a configuration parameter called Docker, and it takes a parameter called image, um, and in the example here, I have an actual image that I use in some of my projects for testing. And the first parameter that I've highlighted there is quay.io. And quay.io is a service, a free service, where you can store Docker images. You're also uh, able to use Docker Hub, is what most people use. And if you're using Docker Hub, that first parameter just disappears, and you only have one slash instead of two. Um, there's not a lot of difference between Quay and uh, Docker Hub. Mostly I'm using Quay because um, my company is using it on the commercial side, and so I use it on the free side as well, just for consistency. But I will show you that it is a little bit neat. Um, I'm going to do my slides out of order. When you're making a new Docker image and you register it with GitHub uh, on Quay, um, you can see that there's a little thing here that says, where do you want this Docker image to come from? And um, one of the options is linked to a GitHub repository push. And if you select that option, then at the time 
that you create your Docker image, it's going to set up the automation so that any time you make a change to the parent GitHub repository, Quay is automatically going to rebuild that image. And uh, Docker Hub does exactly the same thing, but uh, you have to go and set it up. It's a couple more clicks. So um, there's nothing wrong with using Docker Hub. It's a standard. Most of you will probably use it. But I just wanted to show you that little bit of streamlining. So the Docker image itself, uh, you can just give it a from line where you inherit some other Docker container that a really smart person who spends a lot of time optimizing images uh, might be offering. And I'm, I'm using Drupal Doctor that provides PHP 7.1. And then um, Workdir just gives me a directory where all of my work assets are going to be placed. And the add instruction says that um, I'm going to put things from the local machine's current working directory into my work there. So this is where I put all of the scripts that I'm going to be using in my sub-projects. And then they can just know that at the very root of the file system is this folder called build tools CI. There's a bunch of scripts in there, and I just run them. The other huge advantage of using Docker for testing is that it increases the speed and the reliability of your tests. As you can see down at the bottom, there is a series of statements. And they're just like bash statements, except they start with the word run, which is what Docker uses to say, you know, do this thing. So in a typical circle one configuration file, you'll install a bunch of things that you need, and it copies them down every single time. And this takes time, and it takes bandwidth. Um, but the other problem is, Occasionally, the tools that you use to do your tests might, hopefully never, but might sometimes accidentally have a bug introduced into them. And it's a real bother if you accidentally introduce a bug into one of your own test tools and break all of your tests for your downstream. So uh, to help protect the stability of your test, if you've baked the most recent version or the version of the tool that was most recent at the time you made the Docker image and tested that Docker image, you know that you won't be taking as many updates to that tool as you would if you were just asking for, uh, from Composer, you know, hat version one, the, the latest stable tag. Um, and then you have to make the conscious effort to update your Docker container and test it, and then you know that that version of the tool is good and you won't be introducing any problems downstream on your tests. So um, that's why I'm liking my new found pra practice of, of using Docker and tests. It makes them a lot more stable. Now this is just a little brief aside. It was something that I thought I might spend some time talking about in this presentation, but there's so much to automate that I had to kind of prune things down. So I, I'm just mentioning that this is a thing. If you have a IDE like PHP Storm, it has code generators. And uh, if you've made a task, I mean, if you've made a class, you can tell PHP Storm to generate a PHP unit test. And then you've got your scaffolding all up, and you can just add in your asserts, and it'll make things go a lot better. So um, I recommend surveying the tools, giving it a try. Maybe you'll find them helpful. Maybe you won't. It depends on how fast you can type PHP unit tests in your sleep. Um, I tend to not automate them very much myself because I've written a lot of them. But when you're just getting started, the tools are really helpful. And it helps you sort of get an idea of, of what to test when you line up your tests with your classes. Moving right along, deployment is another task that we commonly like to automate. Uh, one example of that is releases. Um, the, the Travis tool will uh, help you automatically set up your GitHub releases, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then there's also, once your releases are released, the users of your tools need to get them uh, so we can provide self-updates. So the Travis tool that I showed you earlier has many, many commands. One of them is called setup releases. 
On this sl slide in the red there, I show you passing in a token which will authenticate. If you leave that part out, then the yellow lines below will be displayed where it asks you for your credentials. So you can either provide an OAuth token if you have one around, or if you don't have one around, you can just type in your credentials. Um, and then you give it the name of the tool you want to upload. Now the name of this tool should be some FAR file that you've built in the test before getting to the releases section. Um, and what will happen here is after your test builds the FAR, uh, the commands that this tool will insert into your Travis YAML will upload that tool to GitHub so you don't have to write any of that configuration yourself. You just run this tool and then every time your release test passes, um, that is like, you know, if you, if you tag a, a Semver version of your tool, then your FAR will show up in the releases section in GitHub for people to download automatically. I'd also like to give a little shout out to this PHP task runner called Robo. It's pretty nifty. Um, recently, you, some of you may have attended the Drush 9 session. Uh, Drush 9 has been rewritten to be based on top of the Robo PHP task runner, which also provides a framework for writing CLI commands. And uh, in addition to that, Pantheon also uses Robo as a basis for their terminus automation tools. And uh, Grasmesh from Acquia has rewritten their BLT tool to be based on top of Robo. And uh, Nerdstein has a build tool called Build, B-I-L-D, that has also recently been ported over to run on top of uh, Robo. And I'm not going to go into what you can do with Robo because it does a lot and it makes it really easy for you to write tools that are, you know, very short. You just write a simple, a simple PHP function that does some operations and Robo will pass in the arguments from the command line and the options and it, it makes it very simple and it's a real Symfony console application. Um, this little rectangle on this slide shows how you set up a Robo application. The instructions for that on, are on robo.li slash framework. And uh, the interesting thing is that highlighted line down at the bottom, if you pass in your GitHub organization and project name, then Robo will automatically add a self-update command to your application. And when you run self-update, it will replace your Robo FAR with your latest release that Travis pushed up to you from the process that you set up with the Travis tool on the previous slide. So that's pretty nifty. A lot less work to do something that used to take a while to code yourself. The tools will now do it for you. And finally, maintenance. Now, Composer has sort of changed the way the PHP world does its business. And um, in a way, updates are easier because you just run Composer update and everything happens. But um, then on the flip side, suddenly this manual task of running Composer update and making sure that the dependencies still do what they're supposed to has become a point of uh, tedium. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really, really helpful if you have made really robust tests so that after the Composer update runs, you can create a PR and your automatic tests should show, your automated tests should show that the dependencies are still running. But that's, redu I mean, it's repetitive just to run the automation. So let's try automating the automation by uh, using this automated composer update procedure. So we're going to start this thing off with uh, Travis Cron. It's a new feature of Cron. It's a few months old, six or 12 or so, or I don't know, lose track. But um, in the Travis settings now, you can just go in and turn on Cron and it'll start uh, running your tasks in a repetitive process like this uh, perpetual motion machine that Leonardo da Vinci designed. And what we're going to do in Travis Cron is we're going to use a tool called Composer Lock Update. Composer Lock Update is a, a nifty little tool written by Daniel Bachhuber, the author of WPCLI, which is a 
Drush-like tool for WordPress. And um, if we want to be really, really wild, and we really trust our tests, and we know that we're just testing dependency changes, we can also automate the merge of this PR back into master, uh, ideally not releasing straight to your users, but at least on your dev branch, you, you can keep your dependencies up to date at whatever frequency you've set up your Travis Cron. So the way this looks is that Travis Cron execs the composer lock update tool. Composer lock update uses the hub tool to create a GitHub pull request for you. Uh, the GitHub pull request uses its built-in features of GitHub to send a REST request to Travis. Travis will run your normal automation tests, and when that passes, it will send, oh, I labeled that wrong. It's not REST there. It just XX code to merge the branch, and uh, GitHub will do the rest. So th this GitHub pull request is only created by Composer Lock Update if there are actually updates available, and the merge only happens if the tests pass. So Travis Cron, as I mentioned, in the settings page, there's this new area that says Cron Jobs. You just identify your branch, often master, and how often, either daily, weekly, or monthly, do you want this to run, uh, and then hit Add. The interesting thing about it is as soon as you add the tool, it schedules it to run in about a minute. So if you want to test a task that runs on a daily basis, you, know, you can try to ad hoc test that on your local machine a bunch of times before you set, up a, set it up on Travis. But likely, no matter how much you test it locally, the real system might not work exactly right and you might have to do it several times. Uh, so all you really need to do is, if your test fails once it's in Travis, just delete it, reschedule it again, and it'll run again in a minute and you can try it out. And keep iterating until your automation is doing the right thing. So in order for this to work, you also need to add a GitHub token to your Travis settings. And uh, the way you do that is you go to github.com settings tokens and click on generate new token. And from there, you will get this new personal access token page. You can write in a description that reminds you of what you're using this token for. You should give it the repo scopes, and there are some other scopes you might also want if you pl are planning on using your automation to delete repositories. There's a delete repository scope. The other scopes you probably don't ever need to add in automation because they're things like add users to groups and things like that. Once you create the GitHub token, it'll print this great big long number. You can just copy that number into Travis uh, through the web user interface, or you can, again, run Travis and set GitHub token and paste in the thing that you grabbed from the GitHub user page. In my previous presentation that I referenced uh, in my session description, I talked about uh, Travis and uh, different techniques you can use, including highest, lowest testing. If highest, lowest testing, if you set an environment variable to dependencies highest, then you ignore the composer lock and bring in the latest dependencies. And if there's an environment variable set for dependencies equals lowest, then you ignore the composer lock and run composer update with prefer lowest. And this allows you to run tests that span the range of all of the dependency ranges that your composer JSON claims that you run with. It's a good practice. Uh, so if you're already doing that, you can just insert one more environment variable in one of your matrices and uh, just set that to one. And then if you're running multiple parallel tests on Travis, you only want one of them to do your cron automation, because it doesn't make sense to do it three times for all of your different PHP versions and your different dependency levels. Uh, next, Travis is going to set a environment variable called Travis event type. So in this little script, we're first checking to see if we are in the right parallel test that has our post build actions environment variable set. And then we're checking to see if this is a cron job. And if these things aren't both true, we're going to exit. And we're also going to expect that we have a GitHub token in define, as I previously described. And uh, once we get to that point, we just run through and install some tools. And finally, down at the bottom, 
we're going to run CLU, which is composer lock update. And composer lock update is going to run through all of the steps it needs to do to um, create a pull request for you. Now there's an interesting thing about this. You may recall from a couple of slides ago that I decided that I wanted to do my post build actions on PHP 7.1. Now there's an interesting thing that's happening out in the composer world, uh, and that is that people are making a certain category of not Simber compatible changes to their projects without increasing their major version. And specifically what I'm talking about is when PHP 5.5 goes end of life, a lot of projects decide that they're going to stop supporting that. Um, and so your depends, the versions that you might get at different PHP versions can skip, can change around over time because of a version that you used to use uh, for PHP 5.5 might at some point freeze and you'll keep getting newer versions as you're going up. And, Conversely, sometimes when a project wants to support PHP 7.1, they'll come up with a brand new version that does that and it no longer supports some of your older versions. So the problem this creates is that if you create your composer lock file with PHP 7.1, sometimes some of the dependencies you pull in won't work with PHP 5.5 or, or even 5.6. And if you purport to work with those versions, you actually won't because your FAR will have too modern of libraries in it. If you don't need an EOL PHP and you're starting with 5.6, it's usually pretty safe to always build your composer lock file with PHP 5.6 and then that will usually also have components that will support PHP 7 and PHP 7.1 if all of those versions are still active and supported at the time you make the lock file. But it is not necessary for you to actually have PHP 5.6 on your system in order to build one of these, you can insert in the config section of your composer JSON a platform section. And if this says platform PHP 5.6, even if I'm using PHP 7.1 to build the lock file, the solver will be run as if I was running PHP 5.6. So I put this in the composer JSON of the project that I'm running composer lock update on, and that way, when Travis builds my composer lock file using PHP 7.1, it'll do the de dependencies based on PHP 5.6. Uh, then the actual result is when CLU creates a pull request, it's going to tell you what it did. And you can see that the pull request is attributed to the user who have provided the GitHub token, and you may have made a special user for that, or it might just be your own user. Uh, but the commit itself isn't by the user that created the pull request, it's by the update composer dependencies, or, or it's actually not sure, uh, the composer lock update user is the actual author of that uh, commit. So once that commit gets merged back to the master branch, when you list your log, you will see that user in the log list. Now there's a comment in your pull request and the first part of the comment shows you what um, dependencies were updated in this pull request. And after that, CLU runs a, another tool from Symfony, the Symfony Security Check Report. <coughs> this tool will check your composer lock update, or your, sorry, your composer lock file before it's been updated and if there are any security vulnerabilities in any of the versions in that composer lock, it'll be printed out in the report here. Uh, so when you look at your pull reports, you will see these comments that will advise you whether or not there are any security vulnerabilities in the pull request that's being tested right now. So if you're not automatically merging your dependency updates, or even if you are, um, you can put a higher priority on shipping versions when actually this tool reports that there's a security advisory. At the mo moment, the um, Drupal module security updates are not part of this tool. This tool only does things in packages at the moment, but there, I've heard mumblings in the Drupal community that uh, those are going to be integrated. So in time, if you're using Composer to manage a Drupal site, you might also see your uh, Drupal security advisories in here, and that'd be pretty nifty. 
Um, and finally, if your tests pass, we can go ahead and take the composer lock or, or check everything that's in the commit. If there's only a composer lock in the PR, then we can say, that, okay, this is probably safe to merge and just auto merge it into the PR. So it's sort of up to you whether you want to adopt this workflow or not, depending on um, what kind of dependencies you have and what kind of testing you have. Um, so that's neat, but that was a lot of slides and that was a lot of work. And so you're, if you're thinking to yourself, hmm, how many hours is it going to take me to set up all of that stuff so that I can start getting my payback? Well, I've got news for you because we are going to go to the next level and we are going to automate the automation of your automation. So I have a, another tool that you can run that will automatically configure Travis to update the composer lock file of your project with composer lock update. And it almost works. Well, it works, but it's not fully automated. So <clears throat> the tool is called CI. And um, all you need to do is download the CI far from the uh, consolidation CI project. You change your terminal to the, your working directory to your PHP project. You make sure that you have an environment variable named GitHub token defined, and then you run CI Travis CLU. And uh, this is going to make a bunch of changes to your project. It's going to write things to your Travis YAML, and um, it'll make a Travis YAML for you if you don't have one yet. So you just inspect what it did, and if it looks rational, you push them up to GitHub, and then you suffer a one moment, one brief moment of regret because the Travis tool does not yet have a way to automate turning on cron jobs. Um, so you have to run on over and, and click one button. Like I said, Mr. Spacely made me push the button three times today. <sighs> um, but after you do that, then you can be amazed because this tool is just going to crank along and every time one of your dependencies releases a new version, you'll see a pull request show up and if you've done the auto merge, you'll see that pull request go away. Or eventually, well actually right now, it's, this, this tool is not auto closing the pull request. The pull request stays open. Um, that's just because my Git operations were not completely optimized in the auto merge step. But watch this space for updates. We will get that pull request merged, and we won't have to use a um, API call to do it. If the very commit that's in the pull request ends up on the master branch, GitHub will close it automatically, and I just have a bug where it's um, cherry picking and creating a new new hash so it doesn't close it. So. Finished, but not finished. So we're finished with this presentation, but we're never finished automating. So keep repeating and uh, don't get into despair, but just do a little bit of automating all the time. Uh, before I open the floor for questions, I would like to remind everyone that we're having contribution sprints on Friday. The Mentor Core Sprint is in Stoltz 2, and there's a first time sprinters workshops in Lear 1 and Lear 2, this room and that room, and the general sprint is in that great hallway that they call a mall with tables on either side. Um, if you liked the session, or if you didn't like the session, please take the survey and let me know. Um, with that, I'm going to do a brief time check, and aha, you have two minutes to ask questions. No, actually you don't. It's the last session of the day. You can keep me here all night asking questions. So um, if anyone has any questions, come on up to the microphone. Otherwise, enjoy your evening. I'm sorry? I didn't hear you. Could you come up? Share the presentation. That is an excellent thing. I, as soon as I'm done answering questions, I'm going to go to Twitter and I'm going to tweet out the URL that I planned to tweet at before the beginning of this presentation so everyone can get the URLs and notes from, the, from these slides. Yes. Hello. Um, if you run composer updates on your Drupal website and your core also gets updates, you might encounter that your uh, HD access file is overwritten or other files like editor config or doesn't matter. Uh, what do you think is the best approach? And because if you think about automation, if you deploy this to a production platform, for example, you will really run into serious issues. What is the best approach to handle these kind of files? Yeah, conflicts are the bane of automation because in the case of composer lock update, if it can't complete if it can't cleanly merge, then it's not going to make the pull request. So 
this goes back to what I said at the beginning of the presentation, is before you automate, you want to make sure that your process is clean. And I'm going to answer this question just for the one example you gave for your HT access. Now, if you just take your HT access and you edit it willy-nilly, then that's likely to produce conflicts. And sometimes you have to change what's already there, but hopefully usually you don't because, you know, Drupal put it there for a reason. A lot of times what you're putting there can be appended onto the end of the file. And in that case, what I would su suggest you do in your automation is uh, either back out your HT access changes at the beginning or just do, if you're using get, do a prefer theirs when you do the pull so that the Drupal org version will overwrite whatever's there. And then you can take as a post get pull step, just run another script that takes your customizations and appends them onto the end. Um, so there's also a, a project called the C. C. Wiegand's Composer Patches, where you can automatically apply patches to um, projects. So if you have customizations that might cause pull requests, it'll, it's not completely foolproof to make a patch, because patches can fail to apply, but it'll be a little bit more, potentially more stable if you um, always apply on to a, a a base system and, and your applications, just like the HT access, if you try to put your custom code um, always, well, not right at the bottom because new, if your code is exactly at the bottom, then sometimes the new function at the bottom of the file is more likely to create a, a lock, a, a, a merge conflict. But, you know, put them maybe somewhere near the top in a stable location, write a sed script that injects them so maybe they're not even seen at the time of the merge, smooth that on out, and, and then your automation will get rolling. But this is kind of a later edge um, concern because usually if you're only partially automated, you're going to be faster if you just let the conflict happen and fix it. But, but when you start getting down to the, those more fine grain things, that's what I would recommend to, to get that 100%. All right, well, if you're too shy to come up to the microphone, I'm still going to be here after the talk, and I'll be in the sprint room on uh, Friday and Saturday, so hope to see some of you there. <laughs>